Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Johnson & Johnson. Verizon. And by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Observer New Jersey Politics. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to a very special edition of One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I recently co-hosted a panel discussion with Michael Hill, anchor and correspondent for NJTV News, where we looked at the complex and sometimes confrontational relationship between police and the minority community and ways that we can begin to move that conversation forward. Here now is that conversation. I had an interesting conversation in July about a guy, he's a, a school teacher in Newark who was walking in um, a People's Organization for Progress um, demonstration. And he raised a, a, a point that I had heard before, but not the way he had put it. And this goes back to the issue of race. I went to him and asked, to, asked him about, okay, what's the solution to this? What's the issue here? And he took us way back uh, to slavery and said, uh, the institution of policing today resembles the institution of slavery, where there were a group of men who went and rounded up, uh, enslaved men and so forth. And he said that, I'm not saying that the individual police officers in their uniforms are racist, but what I am saying, he said, is that the institution is built on a system that was racist, and we can still see it today. And it works to the disproportionate disadvantage of men of color and people of color in this country. Reverend Gilmore, are we dealing with modern-day policing, a hangover from slavery? It's obviously a very volatile question. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I have a, a certain perspective about policing, okay? And um, tell um, folks uh, one, one of the things. Your background. Sure. Uh, my, my dad was one of the first African Americans on the North Police Force. Uh, he joined the force uh, in 1955, and he retired in 1980. Uh, and um, uh, he and, and the sheriff were uh, partners at one point. Um, we and, uh, and then he was also um, a minister. Uh, so he was able to uh, help bridge that gap. Um, and, and so personally, I have obviously a great affection for the police department and what they do. Uh, I also can't help but look at things from a biblical lens because I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so I can't help it. And one of the things the Bible lets us know is that um, God has ordained authority, but we're dealing with individuals, and there is no police force without individuals. You know, so, so it's hard to, to, to take the system away from the individual mm -hmm. because the individual make up the system. You know, and so we have some good cops and we have some bad cops. We have some uh, who are racist, we have some who are not. <clears throat> You know, and it'd be wonderful if we could, you know, give them all lie detector tests before they join the force, right, to try to find out. Um, but it's a very challenging thing for us to do, but we have to support the institution, I believe. And, and Sheriff Antor, you, you raise an interesting point, uh, Reverend Gilmore. We had this discussion uh, in July when you told me that there are police officers, there are some people who join the force and they're racist. So, and, and, and a lot of times, Prosecutor Valdez, it, it doesn't show up until there's an incident and then it's... It's too late. What do you, you know, do? What I said to you then, and I'll repeat now, is that yeah. we recruit from the human race. And human beings bring to, the, to us, to our service, all of their hang-ups. You know, and in spite of a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a background investigations, there are some who slip through the cracks. There are some who shouldn't be in the service. 
So they do make it, true. We try to weed them out, we do the best that we can. So can okay? I? Okay. You, you believe that? Yes, yeah. Mr. Mayor. So I just think, like, when we talk about system, like, you know, I'm an educator, so obviously, when I think of systems, I think of, uh, you know, whether you're talking about the circulatory system or, you know, the lymphatic system, you know, obviously these are, these are things that work. You don't, you don't need to get, you don't want to get rid of them, but the system, if a system is sick, right, it doesn't matter what individual has that sickness, uh, if the system is sick, so I can take a system from this brother and put it into Todd, if the system is bad, it's going to make him sick, right? And so there's some things systemically that need to change. So the, so the problem, I think, is what, what everyone has said is clear, that there's some individuals who enter, or some free radicals, right, who enter into uh, the police department and they, they make everybody sick or they, or they do something wrong, right? The problem is when you don't have uh, the, the proper antibodies to, to, to defeat those things, and then in turn it makes the body die. So the, the problem is, right, that there is, we have not put anything in place that, are, that will stop those guys, identify it when it comes and say, this doesn't belong here, and begin to, to systemically root it out. People get shot, they don't go to jail, there's no trial, there's other things, things from the drug, there's all kind of, I mean, there's AG guidelines that tell police officers they don't have to go to court, they don't have to make statements, they don't have to do this, there's all kind of things that, that are involved that just need to be disrupted, right, to make the system healthy, right? And I don't agree that we, at this point, need to throw the system away, but we absolutely, positively need some antibodies. But I always remind people that this year was the 25th anniversary of the Rodney King beating, you know? And we've been having this conversation for, not just since Rodney King's beating, but decades before that. You know, you can read Martin Luther King's speeches and he's talking about police brutality. So we've been having this, this dialogue about police brutality for so, so long. And in 2015, we had 991 um, people shot and killed by police officers and zero convictions. In 2014, there was zero convictions. So how can a community trust the police department or the institution itself to protect them and get them justice when they see no evidence of that? We've seen so many higher profile tragedies. And when we see in these videos of people getting choked out on film and getting killed, and we think we have enough evidence to finally convict the cop, and then a non-indictment comes. You know, we're heartbroken, and we realize that the system may not be for us. And what can we actually do now to not just talk about how the system is failing us, but how can we move forward? You know, because we all know the system is failing us. How do we move forward? And how do we actually have these real frank conversations to actually move us forward? Do you have one recommendation you'd like to put on the table right now for everyone? Um, to improve things. Uh, definitely. Um, I think that civilian community review boards is something that's very powerful, you know, and I think that's something in Newark that's been like a model for different cities all across New Jersey. It's something that a lot of New Jersey cities are really reaching for as well. And I think that's something that we also champion around and um, really try to make sure it sticks here in Newark. So, Michael, clearly this issue of the civilian review board comes up. Let's talk about what that is and why it's so important. It's a group of citizens and some police officers as well. They're on a panel. They're looking at complaints that come in from citizens throughout the city. Uh, will this be successful? That's the big question people keep asking. And it depends on, to a certain extent, how you measure success. What will this board be able to do? What kind of authority will it have? And what will it be able to get to in terms of, uh, again, that question about what does justice look like? We'll also talk about improvements in the department. Uh, some people are really pushing for better training, more training for police officers. And the other issue is it, interesting stuff about research on women and violence and how women out in the field can really tone down some of these violent encounters. Uh, we had one police officer there who was talking even after the panel about how he's seen women show up on the, on the scene and automatically it just pipes things down. Let's just remember this, folks, that uh, the federal monitor, a federal monitor is in the city of Newark overseeing the police department. Uh, former attorney general in the state of New Jersey, Peter Harvey. This is an important thing to understand. So as you listen to the conversation that ensues right now, as Michael's about to set up, remember that, that the federal government, the Department of Justice, is overseeing the police department. Let's set it up. It certainly is. Take a look at this. We're talking about police training. We're talking about more women. And we're also talking about the Citizens Complaint Review Board. The city of Newark is under a consent decree with the Department of Justice to transform its police uh, department in the way that it does policing. And part of the consent decree requires that a community survey be administered 
once every year over the next five years. And part of what we're undertaking to do is to create a community survey to get precisely at what Mayor Barack identified. What does a community think, feel about policing and the relationship between law enforcement officials and community members right now? The hope is that through this transformational moment that uh, Director Ambrose is leading with the mayor and other law enforcement officials here in Newark, that we will see a reimagined police uh, department that reflects a very different reality than the one that people in the city are facing. Well, so uh, one of the things I think is important to, no to note is that there are multiple communities in Newark. There's yes. not just one community. Yes. There are people who come here for arts and for culture and for sports. There are students who come in here and leave every day. There are employees and businesses. And there are residents. And among the residents, there's multiple groups. So, and I think you will, you will experience the police differently depending on which of those groups you call your, uh, your tightest community. So one of the things that we're doing is we're making sure we get uh, uh, knowledge of each of those communities about how they feel about the police. Um, our data seem, suggests to us that about 4% of the residents of Newark are involved in more than half of the shootings in Newark. So those people have a lot of interaction with the police around in, in a lot of ways. And that's one set of experiences. And the police will tell you that they spend a lot of their time with targeting their relationships with a particular subset of people. So you need to know how they're experiencing the police, too. And if you just do a random phone calls of the city, you won't get any of those folks. They're not going to answer the right. phone. They're not going to tell. So we are using multiple ways of trying to get at what are those experiences with the, with the police so that we can measure them now, so the police can begin to understand their impact they're having on those people, so that we can look at change over time. Some people feel the police here are doing a great job. Some people feel the police are the problem. Some people are afraid of the police. Some people don't trust the police and don't want to report to them. And those different communities have different understandings. And they talk mostly to each other, so they reinforce those understandings. And they don't know that uh, other people might, might feel differently. I think a lot of it is training. And we, 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 we talk about training, and we talk about police training. But we go back to training in the police academy. For 26 weeks, you're a recruit is running, and he, and he or she should be in top physical shape. But they're talking about tactical stances, and they're talking about self-defense. And you should know that. But we really don't deal with interpersonal, how to deal with the people, how to deal with the public, do scenario-based training, where we just don't see it on a projector or on a, on, on a laptop or a PowerPoint, that we're actually involved. And I think that's important, police training. And the mayor said, hit on something very well, the gap analysis, where we are, where we're at, and where we want to be. And one of the key things in that has to be police training has to change. Interpersonal and social training skills have to be, be taught. Do you disagree, Sheriff? We have a police training commission, which is responsible. The state of New Jersey has a police training commission, and they set the standard. And I've been arguing with them for years. Our police academy here in Newark, when we had one, and now at the county, I happen to have an, uh, uh, a connection up there, because I, I remind them, look, I'm not looking for Navy SEALs. I'm not looking for Marines. I'm looking for people who know how to deal with people. Right. So I don't That's care how many pull-ups we can right. do, how many push-ups you can do. That doesn't make any difference to me. What I want is that somebody come out here and act like a human being and treat people with dignity and respect the way they would want to be treated. That's what I'm looking for. So the training has to change. Up. When we talk about training, that's not just um, when they become police officers because that, that is such a condensed period of time, the, the physicality of it. All of these issues that we're talking about get lost in the shuffle, but it's continuous training. In Passaic County, for example, um, because I am interested in all things having to do with mental health, there was no such um, crisis intervention training in Passaic County until I got there. Now police officers are, are required to come through training so that if they encounter an individual that is obviously something is maybe wrong with them, there might be some presence of mental health or substance abuse, which a lot of times some of these encounters, um, you see both of those things happening there. There's a real opportunity for us to start talking about a lot of the things that are in that report. I mean, from report writing, um, from community sensitivity training, and now it's mandated by our, our AG guidelines that we have to have a component where we're talking about bias, like directly and sort of uh, up front. Let me give you an example of, of one thing that we did. So when the use of force guidelines came out from the AG, it's a very thick document. And I could have simply said, let them read it. Mm -hmm. That could have been my position. What did you do? Well, instead, we partnered with the Bronze Shields of Patterson. We did a forum where we invited the public, and they actually played out scenarios with members of the public. 
And I watched with fascination because the, the audience didn't know what the roles were playing, um, but almost invariably, the person shot the other person. It's because it gives them an example of how quickly these decisions have to be made, and it was very interactive, and the bronze shields did it with us. So it became mm -hmm. real. So those guidelines became real. And people that were very adamant about how the police are out of control, they're this, they were the first ones that shot during those scenarios. So it was when very eye-opening for us. Yes, absolutely. Some of the studies show that by nature, almost, especially when kids are really young, that girls are a lot less aggressive and violent as boys. And even perhaps so later on in life. If that's the case, if this is this discussion is talking about less aggression, less violence, better ways to uh, uh, approach some of these issues out on the street, shouldn't departments hire more women who are more apt to, 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 to I mean, no really, in terms, in terms of law enforcement? Yeah. It, the police it, department it, it, has the highest concentration of women. We have 22% females in the North Police Department. And so if that's the case, and, and women are more prone to de-escalate, to talk and work, shouldn't departments hire more women? So two things. One, the answer is always going to be yes to that. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the second thing is, while I commend the, the New York Police Department for, for having uh, such high uh, numbers of women uh, on the police force at 22%, you know, 22% is not 50 and as a result of that, we have a long way to go, which is great because there's, there's worlds for, for improvement in that space. I can't uh, necessarily speak to the recruitment effort in the police force, and so I defer that to Prosecutor Valdez. Um, what I can tell you, though, is um, just uh, like just about everything else, that when you add more women to the mix, right, it all gets better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, why would that be? Oh, well, I don't know. Perhaps it is because of the same way that many of us experience our own childhood, right? Women tend to oftentimes be consensus builders, right? We believe in the fact that there is a win-win for all of our children in a variety of environments. Perhaps that lends itself to the way in which we approach our daily work. I know that it has a lot to do with uh, my management style, the way in which I approach my team. I often say I don't have staff. We are a team. Right? We are all in this together, and so as a result of that, then we each have to have our own voice heard and need to ensure that we all feel respected as we come to the table from completely different spaces and places in this world. But I will tell you this, that even having women there, you are absolutely correct. Those studies absolutely do evidence um, exactly that of what you speak. We will still have to do the issue that we've heard. When I talk about the fact that we just need unconscious bias training. I'm not talking about just the police or just the, I'm talking about the people who come in who, who are going to be sitting as your grand jurors. I'm talking about at every stage of the game. You cannot expect individuals to come into any environment where they have a decision to make like this without having the proper context and the lens through which to view the circumstance. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. I want to be clear here. So you look at a video, and you don't know exactly what, you th what you're seeing, but you think you see Eric Gardner in Staten Island being choked as he is saying, I can't breathe, as he's on the ground being choked out multiple times, as he's being choked out by a law enforcement professional who is not stopping. Now, I tried a million different ways to make sense of it. And again, I'm a civilian. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask any law enforcement professional to, to, to what? Let me, let me chime in on that, because I, I see where you're going. Let me, let me tell you why it's significant about the chokehold in the NYPD. Back in the 1980s or, or, or 1990s, the department, the New York City Police Department, banned the use of chokeholds. Is that banned here in the city of Newark? It's banned, it's director. And, and, we could and, not do that here. No. And the reason the city did it was because it found that these chokeholds either maimed or killed people. So they said, don't do it. In uh, December 1994 or 95, a police officer named Francis Lavodi in New York had a long record, was in a force monitoring program, going out on the street in a car with a, a high-ranking supervisor. He gets into a scuffle with a guy named Anthony Baez, who's uh, asthmatic and, uh, and playing football out there in the middle of the night, only house but practically on the block. And, uh, and the ball hits the car. Lavodi gets out of the car, uh, rolls the window down and says to him, hey guys, move the football game down the street. 
So they say, oh, 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 okay, we're just right here in front of our house. They move it down the street. Eventually, the game moves back. The ball hits the car again. The door opens. The voter gets out like a sheriff. I told you it's so-and-so, so-and-so. And before you know it, here's a physical confrontation with Baez. Baez's mom is up in the window screaming, you can't choke him like that. You can't hold on to him like that because he's asthmatic. The voter has got him on the ground, choking literally the life out of this guy. And the case went to trial. Judge Judy's husband, Gerald Scheinle, in the bench trial, acquitted the officer. Uh, Daisy Boria, one of the officers, came and testified. And uh, this was on 60 Minutes, too, received death threats because she didn't toe the line. She crossed the blue line. Uh, Lavodi feared very much the feds coming after him for civil rights violations. Mm. They went after him, they convicted him, and he went to prison. But the point is, the department barred the use of chokeholds. And then here it is, years later, that's what took down Eric Garner. And again, to go back to Zelly's point, Levi's point, no charges against the officer. The feds are still investigating. And that's, part of, that's so much a part of the angst and, and the, the disgust mm -hmm. with the Eric Garner case. But to that point, I've never heard Armando, I've never heard the director, I've never heard Levi or anyone else in law enforcement defend, unless I have this wrong, I've never heard you defend what we just described but what the heck do you say to others who come to you let, asking for justice? Let, let, let me say one thing, in, in two other police officers in the room here. When we're talking about racist, and does it, does it occur in the North Police Department, without a doubt. Racism starts as a child before you come on this job. It doesn't start when you fill the application out, okay? So the thing is, we have civil service in, in our community. We have to take a civil service exam. And, and the mayor and me had a conversation, and I'm almost to the point where having the citizen uh, review board do the interview. Because when they go to a psychologist, the psychologist, just like police shootings, they don't test, this, test one's fright. So we're talking situations. You're talking about Eric Gardner selling cigarettes. Personally, I can't put myself in that police officer's shoes, but police officers are trained that if someone resists arrest, you could use force to affect that arrest. Okay. What did you but, see? But I, I would, but listen, it, it's the individual. Well, it's a cigarette. He's selling cigarette Lucy's. He's out here. You know, the store owner's probably complaining. The citizen's complaining. Is there other means that we can take this individual down? What did so you everyone, see? Everyone, he, he the, the police officer, uh, uh, he resisted arrest, and he, he went like he was a, a victim, a, a suspect of, 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 a, of a heinous crime that he was co had committed. So I think that each cop, each individual, sees things differently. The same thing with police shootings. I've been, I've been 30 years, never fired my gun. There's people that I know that have been on the job five years, fired the gun six times. So it comes down to fright and situation. But director, I, I just, I, we could jump to a lot of different things and it can confuse things. I just want to be clear, because at some point, I'm wondering, can we agree on anything? Can we agree that what we saw on video in Staten Island on any level made no sense, was egregious, and took the life of Eric Gardner for no good reason. Yes. Yeah. We yes. Agree. We, 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 we could agree. We, we could agree, agree as, 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 as we could agree as all in this room that it was extensive, for for for, for the it was for the crime that was committed. It was extensive, but that police officer was doing just what he was trained to do. Okay. You know, I understand. Also, as a as my son is a police officer, I hear what you're saying, but it's troubling. I don't that's condone right. it. It's, don't, don't, I get it. I don't condone but it's it. Trouble. But you explain, you try it's, to explain. You don't right. condemn Listen, it, though. When we explain things away like that, I think we give credence to something that's very dangerous. It's a rationale. And again, there's more than two sides to a story. And we have to, there's three, there's five. Um, but I know what I saw, and I know what I felt. And I'm coming from a situation where you try to be rational, and, and what happened there was, was not justified. So, Michelle. What, was, what does justice look like in a case like that? You know, so when we talk about justice, um, you know, I believe that that, you know, we're, we're talking about split-second decisions. And I think we have to also go back and have that discussion about bias. Mm -hmm. So what bias was in that police officer's mind that he felt that he had to take such force 
against someone that, from our perspective, was doing something so, you know, I'm not, yes, it was against the law, but does it warrant that? I felt it didn't. What did justice look like for him? There was no justice for no, him. No, in Arizona, for, for his family, what would justice have looked like? I think that police officer certainly should have uh, paid for that crime. And he should that have been was put in crime. jail. Convicted. That was a crime. Do you disagree, Sheriff? I, I don't know about putting in jail and convicted. I, I disagree. I, I don't condone in any way, shape, or form. I think that the, the police officer in that particular case, when you see something like that, you've been in this business as long as you have, and you put in your lifetime work, it, it just is devastating to see that. And other incidents where people have been on film and you say, why? Why do you take that action? We're working so hard to get yes. to this point that yes. we're talking Trust. about here. Yeah. And right. all of a sudden, something like that will right. set us back a year or two or three or four. This, the, this is what sure. we're trying to accomplish here. That's it for this special edition of One on One. I want to thank my colleague, Michael Hill, from NJTV News for co-hosting this important conversation with me. Join us next time right here on One on One. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by PSE&G, NJIT, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Johnson & Johnson, Verizon, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm a catastrophic case manager. I'm a nurse. I feel a sense of responsibility to each and every member that I speak with on the phone. I know where they live. I know their towns. I know the hospitals they go to. A lot of times I know their physicians, and um, I love helping people at very difficult times of their lives. The job I have now is the perfect job for me. I think I was born a nurse.